And uh, I said, well, you know, Tom, I said, just across the river here, there's a little trail heading upstream. I said, goes through some meadows and stuff. I says, let's, uh, let's just go and see what we can find. Hey there, folks. Spencer Rempel, the Moose Whisperer, bringing you exciting hunting and outdoor adventure stories from around the world. Today's story is a continuation from my good friend and hunting partner, Nathan Adrian, a professional hunting guide, moose hunting guide from the coastal mountains of British Columbia. He's going to carry on. If you missed the first part of the story, I'll leave a link right up above. Check that out. So without further ado, let's get right into it. So we start heading up upstream. And we came across this spot where we, we were probably 20, 30 yards, I should say meters, I guess, back in the bush. I, I talk yards. Back in the bush from the edge of the meadow. So we didn't have a perfect view, but we had a good view. And I said, uh, you know what? I said, uh, let's sit here and call a little bit, see what we can come up with. So I gave a call and nothing was happening. We called for a while. We've been calling for about, oh, I don't know, an hour, still nothing. And so I stood up, I'm thinking we're going to go somewhere else for the last, you know, last couple of hours, see if we can, you know, find something. Because it's a small valley, you know, like, I mean, they, they can hear you a long ways, but they travel fast, right? So I took my knife and I cut a nice big chunk out of a birch bark tree because my boss was always wanting me to, you know, kind of, try and wow the customers with my ability. So I was going to make a, a birch bark m m moose uh, megaphone, which I don't use, but they are neat. So <laughs> I thought, well, I'll, I'll build one back at, at camp, you know, and one of them will probably want it and can take it. So I cut this piece of birch bark, rolled it up real nice and stuck it in my pack. And we we're just about to leave. And I hear, whoa. And I said, uh-oh, I said, we got a bull. So I give a cow call and he grunts again. But the call came from the exact same spot. And he was just out of the clearing in the bush on the far side. Mm -hmm. Or in the clearing behind it. I knew this, I knew this area fairly well. So we called and called. And, and I tried to make him think, well, there's a bull near this cow. I took that, that scapula I always pack mm -hmm. and I raked trees and I bull grunted and I cow called and that bull would not show himself. Hmm. So I came up with the brilliant idea. What we're going to do is we're going to continue down the trail as quiet as we can. And we're going to come around behind him. And we'll probably see him at the back end of that meadow. He's probably got a cow or two there. So well, he's not coming out. We, we sneak out of there silent. Mm -hmm. Creep around. We come around. And uh, as, uh, as we come into that other clearing, there is nothing there. Absolutely nothing. Well, the bull must be right there. So I give a cow call. Silence. Mm. I'm I'm only 300 meters from from where I was before. I've just gone in a, in a half circle, right? Mm -hmm. I try bull grunts. They can nothing. Absolute silence. Well, I said he must have he must have run away. He's heard us and he's left. I mean, moose have ears like you can't believe and. Oh, well, you've seen their noses, so. <laughs> so we turn around, and we go hiking back, and, and when I got to that spot, we're walking past where I cut that piece off that birch tree, bull grunts. He hasn't moved. He is in the little 20, 20 meter thick strip of bush between them two clearings, and he hasn't moved. But he's still interested in, in the moose that he was talking to originally. So I go back to calling and calling, and now we're down to, we got 10 minutes of light left. Mm -hmm. And that moose finally walks out. Mm -hmm. And he's 40 inches, maybe a little bit more. So he's not, he's not a, a brute like the one we took that morning, mm -hmm. but he's a good looking moose. And, and just kind of, I, I had my binoculars up and I said, Oh, does he have huge brow tines? And the hunter said, that's exactly what I'm looking for. And so I gave him the go ahead and, and, uh, he, uh, he smacked that moose down and, uh, funny thing, he had to shoot left because when he was in Vietnam, he got shot in the right shoulder and he couldn't handle the, the recoil. He had to learn how to shoot left. 
Oh, and, he... and he smacked that moose, and it spun around, and actually, I think it uh, it turned, went broadside. He gave it another one, and it spun around and ran into the other clearing. So we went after him, went and found him, and he was laying there, stone dead. And uh, as you know, then the work begins. <laughs> so we went back to camp, and I can't remember if we heard the shot or if uh, when we got back to camp, we were told that the boys had taken one down in Big Meadow. Ah. So, mm -hmm. good evening. So that's three bulls in one day. That's that's not our best. We had one year where we took four in one day. That's a lot of fun packing out four moose in a day. <laughs> Anyhow, me and we, we uh, Kelly was resting that evening. He had, you know, big job of shooting that moose, yeah. packing it out. So. So he come with us, he was a good sport, and we went in there and we start working on that moose. So we're working, and it is black as can be. We're working by lantern light, and uh, I'd taken the boss, had a Defender shotgun with a super bright little flashlight under the barrel. Like, you could shoot 100 yards, no problem with that light. It was mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. And we're working away, and Kelly looks at me and said, something is growling at us. And I hadn't heard it. And I mm -hmm. said, are you sure? He said, there is no doubt. And I stand up with that with that flashlight, and I start shining around because I feel we got something coming in close. Can't see anything. Okay, so I keep that shotgun, you know, within arm's reach. This is that's that's grizz country. Mm -hmm. And we go back to working on that moose, and we're skinning. And Kelly looks at me and said, "It's growling again." And I grab that shotgun, and, and I can't. And this time I see a big bull moose. He's off. Yeah, hundred. 100, 110 yards, mm -hmm. standing there. He either the moose in that country had come to a gunshot. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, but whatever's growling at us, I can't see it. I I don't know if I'm looking for a marten yeah. or a grizzly bear. I don't yeah. know what it is. But Kelly was was an outdoorsman, and he's serious. And the look on his face, he wasn't playing no jokes. Mm -hmm. There's something there. So the third time we're, we're back to skinning. And this time I was tuned in more and I heard it too, but it wasn't growling. It was the moose's stomach working and it sounded just like growl of a, of a, like a dog sized animal as it bubbled out. But I had heard it the first time, but I knew what it was, right? <laughs> and and it, so it's the guts on that moose growling <laughs> at us. So anyhow, we, we, he got teased a little bit over that. I bet you never let him live that down. No, no. Oh, <laughs> they were a good crew. We had a lot of fun. Anyhow. Got the corners, back straps, tenderloins, all the belly meat we loaded on our packs. Packed it about oh 150 meters from the from the kill site, and put it there in the middle of another little clearing where we could see it real good when we came back for it in the morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, that way we left the gut pile for you know that's what's going to smell. We left the you know the guts and the ribs for the for the any bears that might come along. And yeah, that was. That was it. We had that moose down and we went back to camp. Well, morning rolls around and we get up and, and uh, by this time we knew for sure that the guys had shot one uh, down in Big Meadow. They showed up in the riverboat. I looked at my buddy Jason, the other guide, and I said, uh, I said, uh, you guys got a moose? He says, yeah. I says, uh, what moose? What, you know? He said, same one we turned down in the morning. I said, oh, yeah. I said, is he big as you thought? And he just gave me this kind of this look, and I knew something was up. So the, the group of us went up upstream, grabbed uh, grabbed Tom's moose, got it in the boat, took it down to camp. Then we all went down to Big Meadow, and they had shot that moose a kilometer oh. from the river. And that's the first year I was guiding. My, my partner told me, he says, you don't want to pack a moose through a swamp. He said, get it as close as you can to the river. Anyway, so we go walking. We had, Like, I, I don't... They could have probably called that moose all the way to their camp, mm -hmm. but instead they had walked all the way across the meadow to, to try and call one out of what's called the keyhole. Mm -hmm. So we go walking in there, and that moose is tiny. He had a 35-inch spread. 
but here's the story as relayed to me. <laughs> okay. So they go in there and they set up and they start calling. And out comes this cow moose looking for a bigger bull with this little bull right behind her. Same one they turned down in the morning, but that's what buck fever will do to you. That's mm -hmm. why you want to trust your guide, right? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the guide had set up about 30 yards behind them and couldn't see the moose. Mm -hmm. He hadn't really gotten a good look at it, and he was a newbie to it. You know, he might have messed up on it anyway, but that moose came out, and the fella, Larry, he had taken three or four moose with us over the years. He's looking at that moose, and he's going to Travis, man, shoot that thing. It's huge, huge. If you don't shoot it, I'm going to shoot it. Had I been there, I would have asked him, what's bigger, its antlers or its ears? Because it was tiny. It had little antlers about that tall and about that wide. Oh. <laughs> he was just tiny. Anyhow, Travis was the guy that was hoping to do a head mount if he got a big one. He was pretty disappointed with what he got, but that's the way it is. There's no do-overs. It's not a video game. <laughs> and... Uh, so we backpacked that moose out, killed ourselves across that swamp, got it, and everybody's dog tired by the time this is done. But somebody has to go down to the lake and hang them moose up. So I said, okay, I said, uh, I'll take them down. And Kelly, right away, and good man, he says, he says, I'll come with you. Oh, good, he's a, he's a, Strong man, good sized man. Yeah, I was happy to have him along to help. And nice guy, nice guy. But you got to remember, he's Travis's older brother. Okay. Mm -hmm. In that place, most men will not volunteer if they're tired from packing a moose for a thousand meters through a swamp. They're not going to volunteer then to go and hang it in a tree. Mm -hmm. But he did. Well, we go down to the lake and <laughs> we get there. And the first thing that he does is he looks at me and he says, you just can't pass this up. And he jumps up on shore, lets down his antlers, takes them over and sticks them in the boat, takes them little antlers and puts them in between, steps back and starts snapping pictures with his camera. <laughs> Brothers, eh? Yeah. <laughs> My rock. You can see it. Well, all right. A big thank you to my friend Nathan Adrian for that excellent story. I know it sounds like I'm cutting him off there, and I kind of am because there's more to come. Hey, with Nathan, there's always more to come. He's a fountain of information, a renowned storyteller, and he loves to share. Stay tuned for more as Nathan has some excellent advice on how to judge the size of a moose's antlers to make sure that you don't make the same mistake. Thanks for watching. More stories to come.